Well, if you were here last Sunday morning, you will recall that Pastor Greg was going to preach this morning on the parable of the prodigal son. He fell ill. I was scheduled to preach in the Vesper service in our series, How to Deal with Pain. And uh, when I discovered uh, Friday morning that uh, Greg was down with a fever and uh, was asked if I would do the morning service, I contemplated doing something different. And I thought, no, maybe we'll bump what I was going to do in the evening to the morning, and that's what I've decided to do. So we're going to deal with how to deal with pain in despair. Now, our evening services at Blessings are teaching services, and so this sermon this morning might have more of the format of teaching. We'll see what happens, what kind of mode I go into when I start preaching. Um, But we're going to deal with the pain of despair this morning, and we're going to look at Psalm 130, And of course, Psalm 130 anticipates a wonderful promise that we find in 1 John 1. I don't know whether Matt Keep is available to read this morning. He is. He was doing double duty. So Matt's going to come forward. He's going to read from John's first epistle, 1 John 1, verse 1 to 2, verse 2. And of course, in these words, we have the beautiful promise that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of unrighteousness. Please come forward, Matt. This morning's reading is from 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, in them, in him, pardon me, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I invite you, if you have Bibles, to turn to Psalm 130. We will project the text on the screens in the sanctuary, so you can read along there as well. But we're going to listen and read, listen to and read Psalm 130. A Song of Ascents, this is one of the so-called penitential psalms in the Hebrew Bible, a psalm in which uh, the psalmist confesses his sin, seeks and receives forgiveness. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. 
Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. This is the word of the Lord. Well, in our evening services, we've been following this topic that Pastor Greg launched some weeks ago, namely how to deal with pain. And if you've been at any or any of our evening services or if you've watched them online, you know that we've dealt with the question how to deal with pain in trial, how to deal with pain when overwhelmed, how to deal with pain and suffering. Maybe there's another one that we addressed this morning. We're going to address perhaps the most severe of pains that human beings can experience, namely the pain of despair, how to deal with the pain of despair. Perhaps you know this morning that for many people, mental anguish is more severe than physical pain. In fact, some people will treat their mental anguish with physical pain. Some people will inflict harm on themselves as a way of addressing mental anguish. The physical pain is preferable to the mental anguish. The physical pain distracts one from mental anguish. And so when we're thinking about the different kinds of pains that human beings experience, we have to talk about the pain of despair. What exactly do we mean by despair? Well, despair isn't simply strongly desiring a situation to be changed. Because if you desire strongly a situation to be changed, you still have hope. A person in despair has no hope. But I want you to see this morning that it's also not a person who has simply resigned himself or herself to a situation. If you have resigned yourself to a particular situation, you don't have hope but the situation is still bearable enough for you to continue. The person in despair, you see, makes two conclusions. One, the situation is hopeless. There's no chance of a better future. And two, I cannot endure this situation. The pain of this situation is intolerable. It is unbearable. So it's hopelessness and the conclusion that the hopeless situation is unbearable. Now the remarkable thing about this particular psalm is that we have this movement, the shocking movement from despair to hope, a movement that we don't often see in life. And though it didn't take the psalmist that long, I think, to write the psalm, this movement from despair to hope can sometimes take hours and sometimes days and sometimes even weeks. We shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that this transition can occur in as much time as it takes to read or to write the psalm. But there is this fascinating progression from despair to hope And this morning, we want to attend to every movement in that progression. And so we're going to see first despair and then prayer, expectation, worship, witness. This is the progression that the psalmist makes in Psalm 130 from despair to hope. First despair, then prayer, then expectation, then worship, and then witness. Well, we'll begin with despair then. And you have this uh, opening cry, out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. What is meant by the depths? Well, when we encounter the depths in the book of Psalms, it's almost always the deep and dark waters of the sea. And I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to be on Lake Ontario, far from land, as the sun is setting, and to be confronted with the deep and dark waters. Perhaps you have had opportunity to be on the ocean, 
and to look into those deep and dark waters, sometimes turbulent, and imagine what it would be like to be in those waters by yourself. You wouldn't have a chance in the world that such a grim picture, and this particular psalmist is floundering in the abyss, in the deep and dark waters, and very interestingly, in the ancient world, those deep and dark waters often represented the dark underworld of death itself, so that it's not unreasonable for us to conclude that this person is being threatened by death itself. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord, I'm floundering in the deep and dark waters with death threatening me, with death near to me. Now, why exactly does he have this fear? What is the source of his despair? Well, very interestingly, it's not depression. It's not homesickness. It's not hostility. It's not persecution. It's not emotional duress. It's not physical pain. What causes the psalmist to despair, I think it's shocking for people in 21st century Canada, it is guilt. He is convicted of wrongdoing. He is aware that he's broken God's law, and in breaking God's law, he's broken God's heart. He is aware that he's estranged from God, that he's distant from him. He fears God. He realizes that By what he has done, he has invited God's anger, God's settled opposition to evil. He has provoked God's anger. He knows that God is a just God. In fact, what's his great fear as he flounders in the abyss? Well, he says, if you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand He imagines the all-seeing, all-knowing God, seeing his every desire, his every thought, his every ambition, his every action, and not just observing it, but noting it, recording it, putting it in a book to be kept for eternity. And it's an overwhelming thing thought for him that leads to despair because of his theology. He knows that God is pure. We saw recently in preaching from Habakkuk that his eyes are too pure to look upon evil. His perfect justice cannot tolerate wrongdoing. That his anger is aroused by evil, that he's opposed to evil. He will not turn a blind eye to sin. He will not wink at sin. He will not grade on a curve. Sin must be accounted for. And so he says, Lord, if you kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? It's a question that we find in Psalm 130, but it's all over the Bible. Psalm 76, who can stand before you when you are angry? Nahum 1, who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? Malachi 3, who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? You say, well, Pastor Bill, those are all Old Testament passages. It's different in the New Testament. Well, listen to Revelation 6, 17. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who will be able to? To stand. So the question is, who can survive his scrutiny when God inspects your life? The all-seeing, all-knowing God, when he inspects your life, who can survive his scrutiny? And so it's not surprising that again and again in the Bible, we have individuals who, in, who encounter God in his holiness and are then immediately overwhelmed with fear. You think of Isaiah. The story is recorded in Isaiah 6. He meets with God in the temple, and he says, woe to me, I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of glory. You have in the New Testament, Peter, 
After Jesus had multiplied the fish so that the nets of the disciples were filled when they hadn't been able to catch fish all night, there's so much fish that the boat begins to sink. And what does Peter say to Jesus? He says, depart from me, O Lord. He actually falls down on his knees and says, depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. What does it mean to to meet up with God who is all-seeing and all-knowing, who scrutinizes everything we say and do, and what if he were to keep a record of all of that? So this man is floundering in a spiritual abyss, despairing over his guilt. Who is this person? Let me ask you this morning, is this person you? Has this person ever been you? Could you ever be this person? Lesson one, the first step in how to deal with the pain of despair is see your plight, understand your problem. In his novel, The Heart of the Matter, Graham Greene writes about the moral crisis of a major Henry Scrobie who has an extramarital affair and he despairs. And Green writes, as the narrator, despair is a sin the corrupt or evil man never practices. He always has hope. Only the man of goodwill carries always in his heart this capacity for damnation. It's good to see your sin, to see your plight, to know your problem. The evil man, if he does see his sin, doesn't care about it. His conscience is seared. But if we are to make our way from despair over guilt to hope, we need, first of all, to see our plight. Secondly, prayer. I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. This man is floundering under the burden of guilt, and he realizes that self-help is not an option. There's nothing he can do to extricate himself from this problem. There's no way for him to resolve this problem on his own, with his own resources. Therapists will sometimes say to us, who are burdened by guilt, you need to forgive yourself. And they might say to us, write down on a piece of paper all of those things you feel guilty about, and then black them out with a black marker. And I think that's faux forgiveness, that's pseudo forgiveness. I can imagine how it's cathartic in some sense. But who is the party that we've offended? when we've sinned? Who is the party whose anger is aroused by sin, whose justice is violated by sin? It could well be the case that we need to seek forgiveness from others, but we always need to seek forgiveness from God. And so He is the one to whom we need to cry out. Notice with me the pronouns of verses 1 and 2. It's I and you. And you and my, it's the personal sinner and the personal savior. It's the human voice and the divine ear. It's the creature speaking to the creator. Be attentive. So remarkable. What we discover here is that when the penitent sinner speaks, the personal savior hears. That's the address we need to go to. When the penitent, repentant, remorseful, confessing sinner speaks, the personal, the loving Savior listens. He always does. So lesson number two, pray to God for mercy. See your plight and then pray to God for mercy. Three, expectation. But with you, there is forgiveness. What a great word. I didn't know this prior to this week, but this word occurs only three times in the Old Testament. 
Now, it's true that you often find the word forgiving and forgiven, but the word forgiveness itself occurs only three times. Did the people in the Old Testament know about forgiveness? Yes, they did. But it was a partial understanding of what forgiveness means. They learned about forgiveness, didn't they, through their sacrificial system. And there was one day in particular in Israel's calendar that was especially important. That was the Day of Atonement. And what happened on the Day of Atonement? Well, there were two goats, weren't there? And the high priest would put his hands on the head of the one goat, and that would represent the transfer of his sins and all of Israel's sins to to that goat. And then the goat would be sacrificed. He would be killed. And the message is there is forgiveness through the shedding of blood. With God, there is forgiveness. And by means of the sacrifice of the goat, there is some kind of atonement, some kind of covering for sin. But there was a second goat, wasn't there? And the second goat is the scapegoat. And the priest would do something similar there, would put his hands on the head of the goat. And then the goat would be sent away into the wilderness and the goat would be abandoned. And the picture there is this goat takes away our sins. He's abandoned, but in his abandonment, he takes away our sins. Now, you discover that the psalmist has expectation, doesn't he? Verses 5 and 6, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. What is his expectation? Interestingly, it's not simply escape from punishment, but he's waiting for the Lord. And he's putting his hope in his word. And of course, in the New Testament, we have this beautiful word of promise that Matt read for us a moment ago. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And how is that possible? Well, John answers that beginning of chapter 2. He, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice of our sins, and not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Sins of Jews, sins of Gentiles, sins of people in the Eastern Hemisphere, sins of people in the Western Hemisphere, sins of men, sins of women, sins of adults, sins of youth. He's the atoning sacrifice. And through Jesus, we have forgiveness. Now, isn't that the best news of the world? It's good news for us objectively and subjectively. We stand before God because of our sin guilty. And because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we are declared innocent. And God says not guilty. But also, we are accepted. And so it's not just, you could be legally guilty and not feel guilty. But if you have a a sharp conscience, you're going to experience the guilt and not just know it. And there's relief for both. Jesus is the goat, isn't he? Not Tom Brady. Jesus is the goat. And he's the one who sacrificed for us, and he's the one who's abandoned. He is put to death so that we might live. He's abandoned so that we might be accepted. And how certain is this hope? Well, it's as certain as the morning. Our waiting for the Lord is like the waiting of the watchman for the morning. And Bible scholars are divided about this. Half of them think it refers to the Levitical priests who are on duty and they're waiting for the morning sacrifice. And the other half think this is a reference to military watchmen, who, sentinels on the city walls waiting for the dawn. It really doesn't matter who it is because the point is the same, and that is morning is certain. Your sins will be forgiven as certainly as morning will arrive tomorrow. 
His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. I was just talking to some people this past week about how amazing it is that God has inscribed into the cosmos these rhythms of morning and evening. Could you imagine living in a world where it was just one long day, but because there's day and night, we're constantly given this message of fresh starts and newness. And sometimes we botch things badly in a day and we think, oh, I I can go to bed and tomorrow's a new day. And as parents, we sometimes say that to our kids, right? You messed up today, but tomorrow's a new day and we could start afresh. The promise of that cleansing and of that renewal is as certain as the morning. And what happens to those who wait on the Lord? Well, you know, perhaps if you've grown up in the church, Isaiah 40, 31, those who wait For the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall work, walk, sorry, and not be faint. So lesson number three, know that God forgives and that Jesus is the goat. So see your plight, speak to God in prayer, and know that God forgives. Then fourthly, worship. The NIV has, but with you there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. The New American Standard Bible, a more literal translation, says, but there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. And Eugene Peterson, in his paraphrase, the message, often wonderful, especially in the Psalms. As it turns out, forgiveness is your habit, and that's why you're worshipped. You see, the whole point of forgiveness is not simply our welfare, but God's praise. And what God wants from us in the end is worship. And we're unable to worship if we're stuck in the rut of sin. And we're unable to worship if we're in despair over guilt. And God liberates us from this kind of despair in order for us to worship, but it should be something instinctive, shouldn't it? And I love this story that we have in the New Testament in Luke 17 about the Samaritan leper. You may know the story yourself about these lepers who were cleansed and who go on their way, but one of them returns And why does he return to Jesus? Listen to this short story. On his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. It's insufficient for us simply to enjoy the gift, we must also thank the giver. And so it might not seem like the reasonable or expected fruit of forgiveness, but the gift should make us praise the giver so that you may be revered. As it turns out, forgiveness is your habit, and that's why you're worshipped. So lesson number four, praise God, sing and worship. And then lastly, number five, verses seven and eight, Israel, put your hope in the Lord for with the Lord is unfailing love and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. This is now the conclusion of the psalm where this remarkable transformation has occurred. The the, the man beginning, floundering in the dark abyss of the sea, and now almost giddy with excitement, 
eager to tell others about what he's experienced. Isn't it something about good news that's hard to keep for yourself? I'm going to confess my sins to you this morning. I knew early on that Winston Bosch was going to accept the call to blessings. And I wasn't supposed to tell anybody, but I told a few people. And I said, I'm not supposed to do this. I admitted my sin as I was sinning. I said, I'm not supposed to do this, but it's just too exciting. I can't keep it to myself. Winston Bosch is going to accept the call to serve at blessings. It's what's true about good news. If we understand it as good news, it's very hard to keep secret. And we want to share it with others. It's what we discover in the Bible. Blessings are never meant to be selfishly enjoyed. Goods are meant to be shared. And the gospel is proclaimed. And so he, he turns his face away from the Lord in prayer to his neighbors, to the people around him. And he says, Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Patrick Miller, the late Patrick Miller, was the professor of Old Testament at Princeton Seminary. And he described as the Lord's three friends, forgiveness, unfailing love, and full redemption. The inseparable friends of the Lord with you is forgiveness, verse 4. With you is unfailing love, verse 7. With you is full redemption, verse 7. They're not just inseparable as friends. They are inseparable from the Lord so that when you meet with the Lord, you also meet with his three inseparable friends. Forgiveness. You're not guilty. You're innocent. Jesus has offered the perfect sacrifice. He's paid the penalty. Unfailing love. God has a love for you and a mercy for you that is steadfast and loyal and unchanging. Full redemption. Redemption at any time for any sin in any person. Israel, put your hope in the Lord because with the Lord are his three inseparable friends. So lesson five is share the good news. This is the progression from despair to hope. Let's see if we can remember them all now. Lesson number one, thank you. Lesson number one, see your plight. Know the problem that's behind the despair. Two, speak to God. You don't have resources to deal with this problem. Your friends don't have resources to deal with this problem. You have to go to the party you've offended. Speak to God in prayer. Thirdly, know that God forgives. He's in the business of forgiving. Wait on his promises. They're as certain as the morning is to come. And fourthly, praise God. Sing. Worship. Don't just enjoy the gift. Praise the giver. And lastly, share the good news. It's so good, it can't but be shared. Let's pray together. Our dear Lord, we thank you for this psalm and for the message it brings. And we pray, as odd as this sounds, that we at times would be overwhelmed with good, with the uh, sorry, overwhelmed with guilt, to recognize that it's the mark of a good person to see that A, he or she does things that are wrong, and that B, when something is done wrong, it's not acceptable. But we pray even more so that we would know where to go with our guilt, 
that you hear and you always hear and you delight in hearing, and you've addressed this problem through your Son, the Lord Jesus, who carried our sins to the cross and there carried them away, who was the goat who was sacrificed and the goat who was abandoned so that we might be forgiven and accepted. And we pray that this forgiveness would generate in us the consequences of worship and witness, praising you, telling others about what you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.